Hello, my name is Dr. Dan Rubenstein. I'm a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology at Princeton University. And I study wildlife. In particular, I study zebras. And one of the first questions that have been asked is, why are there, what are the differences between grevy zebras and plain zebras? Let me start by saying there's actually three types of zebras. There's the mountain zebra in southern Africa, and then there's the zebras in East Africa. The common or plain zebras runs all the way from the Horn of Africa down into South Africa, but the grevy zebra is much more restricted, and 95% of the species lives in Kenya and about 5% in Ethiopia. And they're very different. The grevy zebra is bigger than the plain zebra, about 50% larger, and it has thin stripes and a white belly, and the plain zebra has broader stripes and they touch under the belly, so you don't see the white belly. And the grevy zebra has bigger, rounder ears, whereas the plain zebra has smaller, pointier ears. They also live in different habitats for the most part. The plain zebra live in the wetter habitats where, where food and water are close together, and the grevy zebra live in the more arid or semi-arid habitats where food and water are spread more widely apart, which means that they have to travel in different ways over different distances to be able to get their drink and their food during the day. And that leads to very big differences in the social systems or the social relationships that develop among the two species. Because food and water are close together in the plain zebra, males and females can stay together at all times. And they live in the harem groups, which is one male and many females. Females can vote with their feet and leave the male if they don't like the way he treats them. He's on, he's on the lookout all the time for predators and for other males that are trying to intercept the females. They can stay together and get this benefit of increased grazing time because all females can get their food and water during the same day. The grevy zebra, however, live on a landscape where food and water are much further apart, and the two types of females, those with youngsters, the lactating females, and those that are not, tend to go their separate ways. The ones without young can go far from water. They need only drink every three to five days because they're much larger than the plain zebra, and so they go out and search for food, whereas the, grevy, whereas the lactating females tend to have to stay near water. And as a result, the f social fabric amongst the females is torn, so everybody is an independent operator. And we call that system a fission-fusion system. It fissions when females go off on their separate ways, and they fuse together um, periodically when they come to drink at water. Males, since both females are equally valuable to them, um, don't stay with any particular female uh, for long periods of time. Instead, they stake out territories along routes of access to water. So the two species not only differ in their size, in their striping, in the shape of their ears, but also in their overall social system. Another question that's come in is, why did we have the Great Grevy's Rally? Well, the Great Grevy's Rally occurred because the Grevy zebra is the endangered zebra. Uh, plain zebras number about 750,000 um, that are distributed you know, across most of Africa, whereas the grevies have a limited range, but there's also fewer than 3,000. Exactly how many? No one was ever very sure because the traditional way of monitoring grevy zebras was to fly over the huge area that they did range over in Kenya, 25 square kilometers, um, and try to count them from the air. But the problem is, during the hot part of the day, grevy zebras shade under trees. And so it's easy to miss them, even though they're big and, and large in body size. And so as a consequence, most times in small areas, you do a ground survey to try to see the difference between the number you count from the air and the number you count on the ground. And then you create a correction factor or a fudge factor to try to justify why the number seen from the air is usually less than the number seen from the ground. And then you apply this for all over the country on all different populations and different habitats and you get an estimate. But the estimate has very large confidence intervals which can range plus or minus 1,000 individuals. So if you had an estimate of 2,500 and the range could go all the way from you know, 3,500 down to 1,500, it doesn't give you a lot of confidence that the number that you estimate is very realistic. And so our goal was to enlist hundreds of citizens 
from the middle class in Nairobi to the pastoral herders themselves that live on the group ranches where the Grebe zebras also live, and give them um, GPS-enabled cameras so that they could take pictures of the zebras, and every zebra is uniquely striped. We know that they are naturally barcoded, if you will, so that every zebra is unique. And then we can identify who's who. And because the camera has a clock in it, we know when the animal was seen. And because it has a GPS code as well, we can determine where it was seen. So we can get the who, the when, and the where from every photograph. And by working with computer scientists at the University of Chicago and Rensselaer Polytech, we've been able to come up with software that very quickly identifies each individual uniquely, whether it's been seen before, and if so, we give it a name and we add to the database of its sighting where and when it was seen. And if it's new, we then record that it is new, give it an initial location, an initial timestamp, and give it a new name. And by having 300 to 400 different people driving 45 counting blocks across 25,000 square kilometers, we were able to take 40,000 photographs of Grevy Zebra. And our goal was to do this in two days back to back, because if you get a certain number of unique individuals seen on day one, and a number of unique individuals seen on day two, it's also possible to count the number that you saw on day two that you also saw on day one and from that you can create an estimate and an estimate that has very small confidence intervals if you get a large number of individuals seen and reseen between days one and day two and we got almost 1900 unique animals seen on day one and very close to the same number seen on day two so our confidence intervals were very very small and the estimate we got was 2,350 Grevy zebra in Kenya, plus or minus 93. And the power of having an estimate that's really tight means we believe those numbers, which means now we can work with policymakers and range managers to adopt strategies to try to conserve and protect the species so it can sustain itself as well as increase in size. The technology we use is called Stripe Spotter, um, Hot Spotter, I'm sorry. And Hot Spotter finds unique relationships among all the stripes. And wherever the stripes bend or twist or touch each other, then a hot spot is recorded. And each animal has thousands, if not 10,000, hot spots on each side of its body. And so it's very unlikely that two individuals will have the same number of hot spots this deployed in exactly the same pattern. And what the algorithms in the computer program do is it scans the entire image and then gives a score on the number of hotspots. And from that, we can get high probabilities that the animal is a known animal seen before or not. And the power of what we've done is that we can do it very, very quickly. We do it by taking all the pictures of the animals in an encounter when you stop and then comparing those against the entire database to find out how many are new and how many are old. And by doing it from day one to day two, we can get that magic estimate of the number of resightings from day two to day one, which is critical, critical for giving a high quality estimate of the, of the census population size. A question from a, a viewer is, what is the future of Grevy zebras and other endangered species in Kenya? Well, the Grevy zebra, with a number of 2,350, is definitely endangered. Um, when I started studying them back in the late 1970s, there were 15,000 Grevy zebra in Kenya. Now, with the numbers reduced to 2,350, they are definitely um, on the edge of extinction. But the good news is that we were able to also estimate the fraction of individuals that are reproductive and the age structure from the images. Once you have the picture of a zebra, you can look at its relative height, you can look at the wear and tear on its body, you can look for sagging skin, you can look for the um, sex of the individual from the genitals, and as a consequence, we can age and sex every zebra. 
And a sustainable population is one in which the infants and juveniles together make up about 30% of the population. This means there's enough recruits to offset the old individuals that are dying so the population can stay static. In, the, in about 10 or 15 years ago, the, the fraction of infants and juveniles was about 9% in the heartland of the Grevy Zebra Range in Samburu and Laikipia in Kenya. Definitely not a sustainable number, and this is what caused people to be very concerned that the Grevy Zebra might go extinct. But with various programs that we've instituted over the, over the last decade of hiring local pastoral people to be scouts so they could get data for us and earn income, they have become champions and ambassadors of the program. And um, a lot of thanks goes to the Grevy Zebra Trust and Belinda Lowe Mackey, who's the director, and the sponsorship of the St. Louis Zoo to keep that program going for such a long time period. Because that program has engaged hundreds of different members of the pastoral tribes in over eight group ranches. And as a consequence, they become the champions of the zebra. And by working with them, we've been able to turn around the, the fraction of recruits versus adults so that now there's about 30% of the population is recruits all throughout Kenya. And we got this data from our massive citizen science effort. The 40,000 pictures, again, gave us a really strong estimator that the, that the, that the census fraction of, of, of recruits is, is believable and at 30%. And what's even more striking is in five of the six counties, these, these numbers are sustainable, with two of the counties, Samburu and Laikipia, being slightly over 30%, which means the populations have now turned the corner and are starting to increase. So we've gone from a very unsustainable population that was declining to one that is now sustaining itself at the national level, and in two of the counties, the heartlands where Grevy Zebra was always strong, they're now starting to increase in size. So this endangered species is not out of the woods yet, but all the indicators are that it's doing well. Why is it done well? It's done well because the people who share the land with the Grevy Zebra, the pastoral herders, have now taken the Grevy Zebras under their wing. They now see them not as competitors. They share the landscape and the water in particular with them so that the babies have a higher chance of surviving to become adults. And that's why the, the uh, population is turned around. A lot of this research was done at the Impala Research Center um, because we've done experiments to see what the relationship is between um, zebras in general and livestock. And by doing a series of experiments where we had mixtures of livestock and donkeys as surrogate zebras versus habitats where we just raised cattle and where we just raised donkeys as if they were zebras, we were able to demonstrate that the mixture in herds of the two species generally generated higher growth rates for the cattle than if the cattle were raised alone. And the health of the zebras went up because their parasite loads went down when they were raised with cattle. So it became a win-win situation, a true mutualism, um, where the zebras and the, and the livestock do better when they're together. And taking that message out to the community gives support to the notion that sharing is always going to be better than keeping the um, animals separated, which means that the mindset of the pastor people, the mindset of the ranchers is changing so that they allow the zebras to share the landscape and share the food and share the water so that the survival prospects are going up while at the same time the cattle are growing faster and making more profits for the people. A question from, from one of our listeners is, is it common for zebras to have twins? No, it's not. Zebras tend to have a single baby at the time. And one of the reasons for that is that the baby comes out big and it's precocious. And what that means is that within hours of being born, it's up on its feet and it's following its mom. So it has to be big. And if the mom is going to make a big baby, one is enough. Another question is, can zebras be broken to ride? In the past, people have tried to tame and domesticate the zebras, but not to great effect. Um, Lord Rothschild in Britain brought some zebras to England and he did um, habituate them to the extent where they would pull his cart, but few people have ever ridden them. And one of the reasons is that zebras are very, very aggressive, they're very nasty. When compared to horses, they fight much more aggressively, they fight much more frequently. 
And one of the reasons I think this is true, although it's only a hypothesis at the moment, is that Grevy zebras and plain zebras live in more complicated societies than horses. Plain zebras in particular have a whole second tier of social organization above the core family group. The, the family groups amalgamate and join to form herds, which means that any individual zebra has to know a lot more friends, a lot more neighbors in its vicinity. And especially among males, those relationships are often aggressive as they try to strive for dominance one over another so they can have females in which to mate and make babies. And so as a consequence, the zebras have to know more individuals, have to know their social relationship with those zebras, and a lot of times that means they have to test each other through aggression to find out who's dominant and who's bossy, who's subordinate and who's submissive. And so zebras are very, very aggressive, which makes them hard to tame, which is one of the reasons that they probably never have been habituated. Another question is, are zebras related to horses? Absolutely. Zebras, horses, and wild asses are all close evolutionary relatives in the sense that they're all members of the same genus Equus. And that means they're very, very closely related. In fact, we have hybrids between Grevy zebra and plain zebras because they're members of the same genus. And so horses and zebras are also closely related. Um, plain zebra uh, name is Equus quagga, Grevy zebra's uh, scientific name is Equus grevii, and the horse's common name is Equus cabalus if it's the feral domestic horse. And so they're all very, very, very closely related. Another question is, is the geographical area and predators a factor in the health of a band or herd? And what is the known birth rate? Well, the known birth rate varies. In a healthy population of horses, females tend to give birth every other year. Physiologically, they're able to give birth every year, but that's pretty stressful on females, and they often absorb the embryo before it comes to term if they're not in great bodily condition. So a very healthy population is one where a female gives birth, skips a year, and gives birth the next year. One of the reasons that Grevy zebra was doing so poorly is that in the past, a female would give birth and then skip two or three or even four years before giving birth again. Now, from our census estimates and from our photographs, we now know that Grevy zebra's females are giving birth and only skipping two years, so they give birth every three years, which is a pretty healthy birth rate, again, one that's stable. As it moves to one female giving birth every other year, then, in fact, the population will really start to explode and it will repopulate the area. But right now, the zebras are in, in good shape because they're giving birth not every other year, but every third year, which is really good. Um, as far as predators go, predators and zebras overlap, which is, of course, one of the problems. Um, as the range is of both the lions and the zebras get more constrained and more restricted, they're going to be pushed together more frequently than they were in the past. And also the areas where they're going to be free to roam is shrinking. So the contact rate between predators and zebras is also going to increase. What we do know is that on the Lewa Conservancy, where there's a very high density of predators, in fact about 30 predators per 100 square kilometers and about 300 grevy zebras in that same area, there the predators um, prefer to eat the larger grevy zebra. It's also the grevy zebra's uh, problem that the males and females don't have strong relationships together. As I noted earlier, the females wander and live in fission-fusion societies, and the males have territories. Sometimes the females are with the males. And so as a consequence, predators have an easier time of taking the females and their babies than they do with the plain zebras. So predators and zebras do have range overlaps. They do um, prey, the predators prey on, on zebras, and they seem to prey more successfully on grevy zebras. Another question from a listener is, do the zebras protect their babies like some other animals, surround the aggressor and attack? Females do not protect their babies in the sense that um, when a predator attacks, they both run away. They do change their position in the herd so that they can interpose the rest of the herd between them and their babies. We've done some videotaping and some analysis with some of the graduate students here at Princeton University looking at the dynamics of the response of zebras to um, uh, pseudo-attacks where we use a robo-lion. We take a remote 
battery-operated car that we can send towards the zebra herd. We put a puppet of a lion on the back, and when that lion approaches the herd, we go for the center, and we see then that the females with the youngsters are often the first to alert and run away from the predator first. The others then run away, but because they get a delayed start, they are interposed in between the lion and the mother with the babies. So they don't aggressively defend the baby as muskox do by lining up and pointing their horns at a, at a predator, but they do take evasive action. They're on high alert and they use the rest of the group as a barrier to protect them. Been asked a hundred times how zebras get their stripes. Yes, um, zebras get their stripes because of a developmental sequence that certain pigment cells are laid down that make the um, skin cells black. And the different species lay those first pigment cells down at a different stage in the development of the embryo. So the Grevy zebras do it a little bit differently um, in timing with respect to what the plain zebras do and with respect to the mountain zebras do. And as a result, the Grevy zebras have narrower stripes because of that than do the mountain zebras, than do the plain zebras, because each starts the sequence at a slightly different cell count in the developing embryo. But that leads then to the striped nature between black and white. Now, one of the $64,000 questions is, what is the function of stripes? Why are zebras striped? There's, the horses aren't striped. Horses are sometimes spotted. They sometimes have, have stars and blazes on their forehead. But they're basically color coat of a single color, be it beige or brown. Um, zebras are brightly striped, and they stand out in the environment um, staggeringly easy. And the notion that they're cryptic is one that probably is the easiest to dispel. At a distance, they look gray, so they do blend into the habitat. But as you get closer to them, their stripes don't match the striping of the grass background that they're, that they're uh, aligned with, and, and lions would have a very easy time in detecting them. But then why do zebras have stripes? There's three hypotheses that have been put forward. One is the notion of dazzle confusion that as the zebras move, the stripes make it hard for the predator to detect any individual zebra, and the delay causes confusion so that the herd can get outside the domain of danger before the, before the lion can attack. A second one is that zebra stripes make it difficult for biting flies that carry diseases like African sleeping sickness, the tsetse fly does, from being able to detect the zebras at a distance and then landing on the zebra. And the third is that it's related to temperature regulation, that the striping might set up convection cells because the air over the black stripe will rise and wick away the heat from the body, replaced by the air from the white stripes. And then as it goes up and cools, it will come back down over the white stripes, causing convection cells. And so there's three different hypotheses, and the evidence for each of them is somewhat equivocal. The ones for the biting flies is the strongest because um, oil drums that were painted black and white as opposed to solid black or solid white did not attract tsetse flies at the, way, at the same level that the black and white stripes did. The dazzle confusion has never really been experimentally tested, although we've used iPads with um, children and cats to see if, in fact, the striped moving circle, as opposed to a black moving circle and a, and a white moving circle, are um, harder uh, to detect. And we find that the black and white striped moving circles are indeed slightly harder to detect than the solid color circles. But we need to do that experiment more with cats that have the same vision as lions and best to do the work on lions themselves. But that's hard to design the right experiment. And third, we have been able to show that striped zebras the skin temperature is 3 degrees centigrade cooler than the solid brown hartebeest that share the same herds under the same exact conditions. So there is definitely a cooling effect of the stripes, but whether it's due to the notion of the air currents in the convection cells are experiments that we are working on with the engineers here at Princeton. Someone observes that the donkeys in Siwa, Egypt often have zebra marking. Does that make them more aggressive? 
Um, donkeys themselves live in a fission fusion society like zebras, and again, the males face the same problems of having to learn lots of different associations with lots of different males. So donkeys are also aggressive, just like grevy zebras. Another question from a listener is, do they always herd together, and is it a family here? Well, zebras are almost always seen together in herds. It's very rare to find a single zebra out on the landscape. And if you do, it's going to be a lone male. Males um, that aren't able to live with a group of females, and that hence is the family group because those females have their babies, um, if they can't live with the, with the, in a family, they tend to associate with other males that we call bachelor groups. And these bachelor groups ro roam around trying to take females away from the families of the breeding stallions. But every, every so often, there's a single bachelor male wandering by himself. Now you might ask why that might be. Um, it's very difficult to live, to have a high probability of surviving, if you roam alone. So only in habitats where there are not a lot of predators do we actually see lone males wandering. The advantage of being alone when you're wandering is that you don't have to share the food with anybody, there's no competition, so you can fatten up and get strong quickly. On the other hand, if you're alone, it's very unlikely you're going to be able to dominate a stallion and take a female away from him. It's only when the bachelor males form a group are they able to be cohesive and form a coalition that's able to take a female from a, from a male, a breeding stallion. But that doesn't often happen um, very often. Are they really black with white stripes? Well, the skin under a zebra is black, and as I said, the patterning of the cells that develop white and the cells that develop black happens simultaneously as the hair is laid down. So there's black under the, under, the, under the hair, but then there's the black and white stripes on top. Someone asks, can I describe the work we do with local students in Lycipia? Well, we've established the Northern Kenya Conservation Clubs, um, and it started with our work with Grevy Zebras way up in Samburu. On that landscape, we started to work with, um, with the communities and went through the data that they gathered as scouts. We analyzed it, and every year we'd have a baraza or a meeting with the community to share their results with them. It's one of the ways in which they took ownership of what the Grevies was doing and began to understand how they, re, how they um, interacted and related to their own livestock. So it was very important for us to bring them into the understanding of the dynamics between wildlife and livestock. And this really has helped. And as we went to the communities and did this, we often found that the elders would want us to go into the schools and share the findings with the students. And one of the schools, the headmaster came up to us and said, do you see my teachers in the back taking notes? They would love to learn more about conservation. And so as a result, we created a course, a curriculum, um, that again was sponsored by St. Louis Zoo and San Diego Zoo. And we worked out a curriculum that the teachers wanted on how animals work, how plants work, how they interact. They had five main themes um, in the curriculum. And we decided we would bring in the American style of learning on experiential learning. And it's very different from the Kenyan curriculum, which is that the students sit there, the teachers draw on the blackboard, they leave a blank, and the students call out the word that goes into the blank. It's much more rote memory and repetition than it is critical thinking and learning by doing. So we created the Northern Kenya Conservation Clubs to get the kids out of the classroom as an after-school program, put them out in their environment, let them see what was going on firsthand, and explore the patterns that were out there. And this allowed the kids to really get in touch with their nature, which is much more reduced than on the conservancy because the land is often degraded and there's more livestock than there is wildlife. But our, it was our hope that they would become much better stewards of their environments when they become adults and herders through this conservation program. We started out in four schools. Now we're in 
12 schools, including one high school. So we've expanded wildly. We have one day during the summer where we have Community Conservation Day where all 300 kids come together and we have usually 800 or so um, members of the public watching the students perform skits, demonstrate some of the um, projects that they were learning. They've written poems, they act out all sorts of activities. There's an environmental fair where they show certain of the lessons and explain to the public what they're learning. So again, it's a back and forth interaction that is making the entire community aware that the children are becoming much more environmental and the children becoming much more confident in their ability to understand the dynamics of the land around them and share it with their parents. A question from one of our viewers is, I've seen a zebra that was gray striped. Is that normal? Stripe is, striping is highly variable, but because natural selection is so strong, that in the wild, most of the animals that are either all black or mostly white with a few black dots or gray striped f tend to either be overheating, too easy to see from predators, or get bitten by flies with disease. And so as a consequence, they tend not to have offspring, and those traits tend to disappear from the population. Related to genetics, the question here is, is there enough genetic diversity in the populations? In plain zebras there are because the 750,000 that range from the arid lands that they share with the Grevy zebra from, the, from, the, uh, from Ethiopia all the way down into the more mesic southern Africa. So the different populations are adapted to slightly different um, environments and there's mixing a little bit between the populations so there's enough genetic diversity to keep the population um, able to generate new adaptations through mutations that selection can operate on. The Grevy zebra is, an, is a tougher picture. The population size has dropped. It's never gone below 100, so it's never really hit a strong genetic bottleneck. But the populations may be isolated. With the Stripe recognition software, we're now able to build databases to see how far individual zebras move. And we're going to be, for the first time, seeing if there's mixing among some of the subpopulations. If there is mixing, then the genetic diversity will, will be increasing. If the populations are being isolated, then genetic diversity is going to be lost, and then a more proactive um, strategy may have to be adopted, in which case we move some zebras from one population to another to increase their genetic diversity. Another question from one of our listeners is, do zebras get the same hoof problems like horses? Generally, they don't. The, ho the problem with horses and hoofs is they're often in wetter and softer habitats where the hoofs don't cleave themselves and chip themselves into the right form. Zebras live on a very tough landscape. It's a, it's a stony landscape, it's a, it's a hard surface, and their hoofs are generally um, being trimmed by natural motion so they don't develop hoof problems. question um, that was sent to us earlier is, how do zebras communicate? Well, anyone that knows horses know that horses talk a lot. They nicker, they whinny, they squeal, they snort. They make a lot of signals. Close range, they snort. At distance, they whinny and they squeal. When they're upset, they nicker to keep in contact with individuals. Zebras are much more quiet. And it may be because there is more predation at, um, at risk and so as a consequence the signaling is chirps very close together when they're very very close to each other or the ubiquitous quagga where they go quagga 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 which is in fact what their name is equus quagga for the plain zebra and as a consequence they they don't really speak to each other except in very difficult circumstances some experiments that we're working on right now has to do with the function of the quagga and what we're seeing is Males tend to give quaggas when their females get lost. Females sometimes give quaggas when they are lost and they can't find their group. So it seems to be a call that says, hello, I'm here, where are you? And as a consequence, it tends to get everyone's attention. And what's fascinating is that the stallions respond completely differently, irregardless of whether it's their own female that gave the quagga or not, than the bachelor males. 
For the bachelor males, when we play back through a speaker of a quagga, they immediately come running to the speaker. It's as if they hear there's a female in distress and they're going to go find her because she's probably unguarded by a male and she could be easy pickings to set up their own family group. So they bolt right to the speaker. The breeding stallions never do that. The first thing they do is they look up and they look to where their females are. If their females are scattered and, wide and far away, they go to their females as if counting to see if they're all there. If, on the other hand, those females are in place and the male detects that they're all there, then the male might go after the bachelor males and use it as an opportunity to beat them up and just reinforce his dominance. But they tend to only do that if there's other stallions in the vicinity so they can form a coalition to make sure that they can signal their dominance to the subordinates. And so the calling is not that frequent, but when it is, it usually is very, very important because it's related to this problem of, oops, my females made me missing, and that sets in motion two very different strategies, one by the bachelor males and one by the stallions. A question that comes in is it says that in tech, zebras cannot be domesticated, unlike horses and donkeys. How about zebras in zoos? Well, zebras in zoos are not really domesticated. They'll bite you and they'll kick you, as any keeper knows, if you get too close. They're free-ranging in the sense that they're often out on pasture or they're, they're led into small enclosures or they're led into stables, but they're not friendly with their keepers. No one can ride them. No one can nuzzle with them as you can with the domestic horse. Another question is, has the decline in gravity zebras affected the ecosystem, such as vegetation and other species niches? The answer to that is yes and no, but the cause and effect may be backwards. The decline in zebras has come about because the ecosystem has been degraded by extensive and excessive overgrazing by large livestock herds. This has forced the grevies to go into habitats where there's very little water, because that's where the livestock isn't, and there's also areas where there's very little food. And so under those conditions, the grevy's bodily condition goes down and their ability to stay alive and reproduce decrease. And that's what originally caused the demise of the species from 14 to 15,000 down to around 2,000. It was the excessive competition from the livestock that was growing because the number of pastoral people, herders, was increasing. So indeed, vegetation is critical for grevy zebras, as is water, and the overgrazing by people and their herds made it much more difficult for the grevy zebra to survive. Then, then that same impact of the livestock has also reduced the numbers of other species like oryx and hartebeest and eland and gazelles on the same landscape. The true browsers, like giraffe or garanook, have done pretty well in the face of all that livestock grazing. But the grazers and mixed feeders have seen their numbers decrease. What's so important about working with the communities and having our scouts program is as they become aware that the grevy zebra is not vermin, that it can increase the growth rate and hence the profitability of raising cattle, then they are often seen as facilitators or mutualists that can actually help their herding and therefore they're being more tolerated and sharing the landscape and that's what's allowing them to come back. Another question is can different types of zebras breed with each other? Can grevy zebra breed with a mountain zebra or vice versa? Well grevy zebras and mountain zebras ranges don't overlap so it's unlikely that a grevy zebra will ever have the opportunity to breed with a mountain zebra. But grevy zebra and plain zebras do have huge areas of range overlap. And what we found is that the southern edge of the grevy zebra range, there the stallions breed with the plain zebra females. And we think what is happening is that at the southern boundary, the populations of grevy zebras are very small, and the sex ratios are not 50-50. So there's a shortage of females in general relative to each male. If the males can't mate with females of their own species, they can try to force themselves on the females of the more common species, the plain zebras. And the reason they can get away with that is they're 50% bigger than the plain zebra's male. So if they do respond to grevy's, to plain zebras and they're attracted to them and find them sexually active, then they can displace the plain zebra male, cover and mount the female, and get her pregnant. 
Now, it's very unlikely that many of the offspring are going to survive because the number of chromosomes in plain zebras and grevy zebras differ. So the hybrid is going to have a mixture of chromosomes that's going to make it hard for all the cells to divide uh, correctly, and when they don't divide correctly, the foal dies. But on the old Pegeta Conservancy where we work, we have 28 hybrids between grevy zebras and plain zebras, and we've even had one of the hybrids successfully mated by a plain zebra stallion, so we've actually shown that the hybrids can be fertile, which means the genes are now flowing from grevy zebra into plain zebra, and this we call introgression, which provides genetic novelty for natural selection to work on to create new forms of zebras and possibly give them some adaptive traits that against their background of plain zebra behavior and physiology and morphology will make them super zebras. Do I believe that the Przewalski horse came first or maybe the Przewalski horse evolved from the zebra? To me they look like a zebra without stripes, maybe due to the habitat. Well, in general, horses evolved in the New World. They started out as small forms and eventually became the large equus that we know. It wasn't like a vine where they went from small to middle size to large size to very large size. Throughout their millions of years of evolution, the horses got big and then they got small. They had varied shapes, varied manes. We don't know the, the coat color, but we do know from their, from their bones what their overall shape and form was. And, this, and the equus group, um, was highly variable, but eventually we had the equus that formed in the New World just before the last ice age, and they migrated across the land bridge into Eurasia, and there they became Przewalski horse and the tarpon and a few other species of, of, of equus that we, we call the true wild horses of today. At the same time, they migrated south and they crossed the Middle East and went into Africa, where the three forms of zebras evolved. So again, they're very closely related. They're all members of the same genus, but they have slightly different evolutionary histories, whereas the, with the horse predating the, the zebras, who are sort of the derived form that evolved once they crossed Eurasia and, and the Middle East into Africa. Because at that point, Africa had crashed into Eurasia and the continent was no longer a big island, and that allowed not only the zebras, but many other species from, from, from Eurasia to come into Africa. In fact, the lions and hyenas that we see in Africa today are, in fact, derived from Europe and Asia. The elephants migrated out at this time and gave us the mastodons and mammoths that vanished during the last ice age, but the elephants stayed in, in Africa, some also survived in the tropics in Asia, like in India and Southeast Asia. But the others that moved north tended to go extinct um, with climate change and the Paleo-Indians um, driving them to extinction. How can we in the U.S. help with conservation education you're providing to the Kenyans? Well, one of the things that would be really wonderful is to be able to establish um, video pals with some of our Kenyans in the schools. At this point, it's difficult to do because while most American kids have access to computers and tablets, the Kenyans don't. They don't even have electricity in many of the schools that we operate, so it's very difficult to have the connections. But with explore.org and impalalive.org, we're hoping to be able to bring those visuals of the hippo pools to the kids there that don't have access to rivers and don't see hippos and through that same mechanism to build the video links between the um, Kenyan kids and the American kids. In fact, if you go to impalalive.org and there's a series of buttons at the top, if you go to curriculum, you'll be able to, or classroom, you'll be able to see the curricula um, modules that we've developed for the Kenyan students and with a series of teachers from Princeton University's teacher preparation program we've been able to convert those lessons to lessons that are mimicking the themes with wildlife for students in the United States. So instead of talking about zebras and hartebeest and gazelles and impala you're going to be talking about um, wolves and deer and raccoons and other species that we often see in the new world. And again, those lessons mirror the lessons we develop for Kenyan kids. And we think it would be absolutely wonderful 
for the teachers in the two schools to be able to implement the curricula modules in their local schools and then have the students reflect and chat about their experiences because Kenyans don't know anything about deer and for the most part Americans don't know anything about Impala so it'd be wonderful to be able to do the compare and contrast which is so much of science by allowing students to share information and ask questions of each other but we're not quite there yet because we don't have the resources to provide all the students in the 300 students in our schools with tablets but we do now have the Impala Live and Explore.org sites which could be the vehicle for that exchange so we're halfway there and so if we can generate the um, the connectivity electronically then we could have students on both sides of the Atlantic learning from each other and teaching each other which would be absolutely wonderful One of the questions that a student has asked um, early on was, what other research gets done at Impala? I study wildlife, and I study the relationship with livestock. But other scientists there are studying all sorts of different species. They are studying um, how elephants change the landscape, for example, looking at the fact that they bulldoze down trees and open up grasslands, or with the ants protecting the trees, driving the elephants away so that the area fills in with trees. So they're looking at the mosaic of between insects and wildlife and seeing how they interact to create a habitat that's diverse. We also have faculty there that are looking at water, which is the lifeblood of that system. How are storms changing as climate is changing? What we found by one of the graduate students at Princeton in the engineering school is that over the last 85 years, the amount of rainfall has stayed constant, but the interstorm interval has been getting, getting larger. So there are fewer storms during any given time. Well, if the rainfall stays constant and there are fewer storms per unit time, it means the storms that do occur are more forceful. And when it's more forceful, there's more water, and more water can run off and take away soil if it's not particularly protected by vegetation. And so understanding the hydrology, water movement, the movement of nutrients is also very, very important. And so we have a myriad of people working on different projects, each generating new knowledge, but when we come together as scientists, we can use that knowledge to start to formulate um, all sorts of, of, of active um, policy recommendations for governments, better practices for, for herders so that the landscape can be um, um, more stable, and also how you then manage the wildlife as it moves across this mosaic, how to afford it opportunities for safety and security and refuges when there are problems elsewhere due to poaching and the like. And so the Impala Research Center really is a true hub in a landscape that is varied and the knowledge that's being generated there can really transform not only how we understand the complexities of how the ecosystems work, but we can use that knowledge to move forward with better practices and better actions to stabilize um, all the wildlife, from small bees all the way up to elephants. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this. I've enjoyed talking to you and answering your questions. Um, we've covered a lot of ground. We started out by talking about zebras, how they're built, how they function. And we then talked about their conservation. We talked about how the conservation affects people and their livelihoods. And all of this is what's going on in Kenya and in most of Africa. Because 85% of the people are still tied directly to living off the landscape. They need to make livings by raising crops or raising animals. And they will therefore interact with wildlife. And if they become part of the solution, the problems will disappear and wildlife, people, livelihoods will come together in a win-win solution. Thank you very much.